as you all know, we work um, very, very hard at Baykeeper with a great staff on a number of different issues that face our great estuary, the place that we call home, um, the Bay being sort of the centerpiece of our life in the Bay Area. And I uh, want to share both the threats that are facing the Bay and also the work that we're doing to address those with some really significant wins. Uh, before we get started, um, Baykeeper would like to acknowledge that we're on the land of many native peoples and tribal groups who have come to, who came to this region many years before us and still live here today and call the Bay Area and the San Francisco Bay home. We recognize them as authentic stewards of the land and of the San Francisco Bay, and we respectfully support their efforts for indigenous sovereignty and repatriation. Uh, in their honor, we pledge to take pledge to take action to protect the shared waters that make up the bay and its vast watershed. Um, and it is, um, it's an honor for us to be part of this heritage of stewardship. Um, so for those of you who are new to Baykeeper, let me just tell you uh, what we do and what we have done over the last 34 years. Um, many years ago, uh, 1989, Mike Hers started San Francisco Baykeeper. It was a fourth keeper of the whole, of all the watersheds in North America and the first actual bay keeper. Um, and since that time, we have had decades of vigilance and stewardship of the bay, um, which includes um, many, many uh, hours on the only boat that is the actual uh, bay keeper patrol boat. It's the only boat which is city, state, or federal that goes out every week, uh, almost every week. We have now thousands and thousands of hours of on the water patrol of the bay. And this has informed us about the threats that are in the bay and also more optimistically, the solutions that are on the bay. Um, and we are now 14 strong. Uh, these are attorneys, these are scientists, these are field investigators, these are staff who make it all work. Um, and we are in the strongest position as an organization that we have ever been. Um, and frankly, just in time. Um, the, the threats to the Bay of the, of intended or not, of 7 million people living around this beautiful estuary are manifold um, and they require uh, both technical knowledge and vigilance over time to affect change and to make the Bay a healthier and cleaner pay, place for all of us. And it's working. Um, we'll get into some of the wins we've had um, and some of the outlook that we have for improving the quality of the Bay over time. So I'd like to introduce uh, Sejal Joxi Chu, our executive director. Uh, Sejal started as a baykeeper uh, for 20 years ago, uh, she came to this organization. Uh, she trained as an attorney. Uh, she grew up and she can maybe talk about some of this, but deeply involved with the importance of clean water in communities. And most importantly, the detrimental fact of not clean water on communities um, in her experience growing up in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, so. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Sejal, and I um, thank you one on. And finally, I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, we've been we've been working to not just defend the bay, but educate all of us on the threats to the bay and the possibilities for making a bay cleaner. The, the the core part of our work is to have hundreds and thousands of volunteers and people who are engaged in the health of the bay over time. That's what really um, drives us as, as a group of people in Baykeeper, and that's what's really the core to our success. Um, it is a multi-year and multi-decade effort. Um, so thank you for taking the time to hear about our work and the State of the Bay in 2023. So without any more, I'll pass it over to Sejal. Thanks, Peter. Thanks so much. Hi, everyone. I am so excited to have all of you guys here. I see folks trickling in. Um, and can you believe that we had to switch at the last minute to a webinar format because we had so many people sign up? This is really exciting. It really warms my heart that there's so much interest in um, in the Bay and what Baykeeper has to say about the state of the Bay. So thank you guys for attending and spending your next hour with us. Um, for just for my edification for a second, if you are new to Baykeeper and you've never been to an event before, would you mind just throwing a one in the chat? Just put the number one, hit enter. Let me see who you guys are. 
Welcome, welcome, Bryn, Margaret, Jenny. Oh my God, awesome, Diane. Tarnell, Jen, Eric. Okay, awesome. Oh my gosh, we have so many newbies here. It is so great to have you guys here. Thank you so much for joining us uh, and taking the time to be curious about the Bay and uh, for caring about the health of our home. Um, I also want to give a big hearty welcome to all of our amazing longtime supporters who I know are here in the audience as well. Uh, this update and the work you're going to hear about is all possible because of you. You are the backbone of Baykeeper, and we really couldn't do this work without you. We are so grateful for your support of our mission, and I really hope that when you hear some of the updates today, you're going to feel as proud as I do about the work and the accomplishments that we've had. So the plan for tonight is that I'm going to share some of the big threats that made major news uh, affecting San Francisco Bay this past year. And then uh, I'm hoping, cross my fingers, that there will be time to uh, do some Q&A at the end. So stick around, ask your questions anytime throughout the program, and uh, we will definitely try to address them in the last 20 or so minutes of the presentation. Um, you can also, it would, it would really make me happy if you hear something you like, just feel free to comment or put an emoji in the chat because I get to review the chat afterwards and I'd really love to see uh, what you guys thought about the presentation, what really interested you, and um, any new information you learned, anything that was exciting to you. Um, so with that, we will get started and I will share my screen. And hopefully you guys can all see that. Perfect. All right. So when we talk about the Bay, uh, it's a little hard to talk about San Francisco Bay without actually talking about the grand watershed that we are in. The Bay is um, sort of the, the end of this big watershed. And so I don't want to uh, miss out on getting to talk about the rest of the watershed for a second. Uh, the Bay's entire watershed is over 61,000 square miles. That's more than 40% of the state. There are two large rivers that make up the bulk of it, and uh, that's the Sacramento River and the San Joaquin River. Uh, and they both come together and form the San Francisco Bay Delta, which is actually the only inland delta in the whole world. The delta is also unique because the water is brackish. I bet some of you know what that word means. Brackish is where you have ocean water that's salty coming in and it meets fresh water from the rivers. So you've got that mix of water that's called brackish. That creates a really special ecosystem that ends up being home to more than 750 plants and animals. And it includes a lot of species that are really just only endemic to the San Francisco Bay watershed. And that, that includes fish that you've heard of like the Delta smelt um, or the California split tail and the winter run Chinook salmon. They're, those are only found here. Since the watershed is hydrologically connected, any pollution and destructive activities that happen in the upper watershed and Delta can also have a negative impact on San Francisco Bay. So that can include things like toxic algae that turns the delta green, like happens almost every summer nowadays. And uh, it can be dry riverbeds. This is a photo of uh, the San Joaquin River that we captured last year with our drone. You might be happily surprised to know that Baykeeper does work throughout the watershed to protect the bay. But I'm going to save those details for another presentation. And tonight, I'm actually just going to focus on the bay. The bay itself is about 1,600 square miles, and it's surprisingly shallow, 12 to 14 feet deep on average. Uh, the deepest point is at the Golden Gate, which is close to 400 feet deep. There are more than 7 million people in nine counties living in 86 big cities around the bay. And there are hundreds of vessels and oil tankers that cross the bay every day. In light of current events, I also wanted you guys to know that there are hundreds of miles of rail lines that carry oil and other hazardous materials around the bay and through our communities. And there are over 1,600 industrial facilities that surround the bay. All this to say is that the bay is located in a highly active urban environment. Okay, now we're gonna have 
a, a little bit of fun. We've got some poll questions for you. If my staff could put those up now, perfect. If you guys could just take a second to answer those, they're pretty quick, nothing too hard. Don't worry, just try your best. And we'll give you guys uh, a few seconds to respond. We wanna try to get a majority of respondents here. Go ahead and get those in. Perfect. Nice job. And my team's going to close it out when we've got about 75% of the folks responding. So get those answers in. Hopefully I haven't tricked you too hard. All right, perfect. Okay, we can see what some of the responses are. This is awesome. Thank you guys so much for responding. Uh, I love seeing these responses. It's really good to know where the audience is and uh, who's out there. So um, we're gonna be talking about a lot of these issues today and from Baykeeper's perspective, uh, what the answers are. So um, I will not, hold you in suspense for much longer. Um, let's go through them. So the bay does look beautiful and a lot of people think that it is healthy. Um, and that is, it's debatable for sure. Uh, we believe at Baykeeper that it's one of the more contaminated in, or estuaries in the world. Um, it, it is very urban as I discussed. And uh, that means that, that while we don't have a lot of stinky sewage and visible trash piles anymore like we used to before the Clean Water Act was formed, um, we do still have a lot of invisible pollutants like selenium and oil and other things that we're going to talk about today. So um, it, it is beautiful. I agree. That is a true part of the statement. Um, laws that protect the Bay are strong. So in Baykeeper's perspective, the green reputation of the Bay Area belies the fact that the laws are actually not as strong as we would like them to be. We are not able to enforce the laws sometimes because they are so weak and because there are so many loopholes that polluters can exploit. And then government agencies, unfortunately, don't always uphold the law and protect the Bay. Um, in fact, sometimes even when we bring evidence of egregious pollution to agencies' attention, they often turn a blind eye and they cite a lack of resources or inadequate staffing and aren't able to address the issues that, that we sometimes focus on. So our longtime Baykeeper supporters know why it matters to have a local organization like Baykeeper on the water to defend the Bay. And I hope that I can um, share more information with you guys tonight so that you learn a little bit more about our perspective on the Bay and the health of it. So now you're armed with the context and ready to learn. And I'm going to talk to you about three of the biggest problems the Bay faced this year. Those include extreme weather, fossil fuels, and sea level rise. There are lots of threats to the Bay. So you might be wondering, well, how did Sagel pick those three? Um, it was actually challenging to just pick three to talk to you about tonight. But I had a very limited amount of time, so <laughs> I was told I only had 30 minutes. So here we go. We're going to talk about these three because they were all big issues in the past year, and um, they are priorities for Baykeeper's work. So that means I can update you not only on the current events and the news, but also tell you a little bit about what Baykeeper is doing to tackle the issues. So we're going to start with extreme weather. As the climate crisis worsens, and over the past years, we've seen extreme droughts, wildfires, and now we're seeing flooding. With all of this extreme weather, we're seeing severe impacts to the Bay. In some cases, the situation has been so bad that it's made national and international news. And even though the news has been bad for the Bay, just for a second, if you'll allow me a little bit of a feeling of pride in my staff, um, we have been all over the news coverage this past year uh, in terms of Baykeeper and our staff expertise. So I hope that makes some of you supporters out there feel proud to be part of Baykeeper too. 
So uh, you may have heard over the summer that extreme weather caused the bay to turn brown. In July, swimmers and other recreational users around the bay started reporting brown murky water to us. Our field team investigated by boat and drone, and, and we even got on a plane to assess the spread of the brown water. Our staff uh, also sits on the Bay Area's steering committee that advises local agencies about nutrient management in the Bay. And they had been warning us for a long time that they suspected that nutrient over enrichment would become the biggest problem for the Bay. And over the course of a few weeks, they saw that the spread of the brown murky water was really alarming. Almost every corner of the bay was discolored. We collected samples of the brown water and sadly our scientists suspicions were confirmed. It was an algae called heterosigma ashikawo. It's an algae that went out of control and ended up causing these red tides all over the bay. And unfortunately it ended up being toxic to fish. It's likely that the season's warmer temperatures, hot sunny days, and calm waters all created perfect conditions for the algae to flourish. And unfortunately, there's nothing really to stop it from happening again next summer if the conditions are right. The only way to prevent algal growth from growing out of control is to reduce the food source. That means we have to reduce the levels of nitrogen and phosphorus in the bay. Because of our urban environment, the bay receives discharges from 40 wastewater treatment plants. Those fully treated discharges contain high levels of nitrogen and phosphorus, which feed the bay's naturally occurring algae. Baykeeper's science team is now advocating for change to wastewater treatment in three main ways. We're working with our partners to understand the risk of future algal blooms, and we're presenting that information to the local agencies to try to come up with, with solutions. We're also advocating for reductions of nutrient pollution in the Bay by strengthening a permit that sets limits for the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that sewage treatment plants can discharge into the Bay. Right now, the city of San Francisco and East Bay Mud are the two largest nitrogen and phosphorus polluters in the Bay, and they are not really willing and interested in looking at ways to reduce that, that pollution that's getting into the Bay because it's very expensive. So we're advocating with federal and state legislators to also get more funding for wastewater infrastructure improvements. This is gonna be critical to getting our wastewater agencies on board with upgrading their technologies. So while we can't control water temperatures, warm weather or sun penetration, the only variable that we can control is how much food the algae have to eat. And getting rid of that pollution is gonna take a collaborative effort by all the agencies and of course, a watchdog like Baykeeper, who is not so gently nudging them to do the right thing. Unfortunately, the bad news for the Bay didn't end when the algal bloom started decomposing. We received the first hotline reports of dead fish on a Sunday morning in August. The algae die-off was likely caused by oxygen levels, which plummeted drastically all at once. And that caused a massive fish die-off of not just minnows, but also sharks, rays, and even the great white and green sturgeon. It was devastating. Thousands of fish are known to have died, but the problem is that the death toll was much higher because many of the fish sunk to the bottom of the bay or got washed out in the tides. I still remember our baykeeper staff meeting that week where everyone was just silently devastated about hearing about all of the dead fish that we, that we were seeing. The dead included more than 400 white sturgeon. These are North America's largest fish. They are amazing creatures that date back to the Jurassic period and swam with the dinosaurs 160 million years ago. They have survived this long only to have a large portion of their population wiped out recently because of this algal bloom. This prehistoric fish are now nearing extinction. Scientists are concerned it's gonna take decades for the adult population to once again reach pre-2023 levels. And we may never get there if another algal growth happens in the Bay this coming summer. Baykeeper is doing three things to help the Bay's fish after this devastating summer die off. We're working with commercial fishing partners and scientists to support the catch and release of white sturgeon this year. 
that's going to impact the commercial fishery, but that might be the only way to help the sturgeon not get wiped out. We're also working for endangered species status for the white sturgeon so that they get protections that they need. And in the bigger picture, as I mentioned earlier, we're working to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus pollution from sewage treatment plants to help prevent future algal blooms. The bay also got hammered again by extreme weather this past January. The storms brought massive rainfall to the Bay Area and recorded rain, the record rain levels flooded our streets and overwhelmed sewage treatment plants. Except in San Francisco, which has the only combined sewer and storm system around the Bay, treatment plants are supposed to be closed systems. Sewer pipes are only supposed to carry wastewater from our sinks and toilets. But because these thousands of miles of pipes are decades old, crumbling and poorly maintained, they allow for rain to infiltrate. The flow gets to be too much during big storms and the wastewater treatment plants have to proactively discharge untreated water to be sure that the plants don't fail. All of this mess meant that the bay was inundated with raw sewage over the course of just a few days. Record reports hundreds of millions of gallons of, of sewage spilled into the bay. And raw sewage in the bay is a threat to recreational users. Anyone who comes into contact with the contamination is exposed to bacteria and viruses. And the untreated wastewater also contains harmful chemicals from pharmaceutical and cosmetic products that are toxic to wildlife. The January storms highlighted a failure of infrastructure and Baykeeper is tackling that problem in a few ways. We've identified the top sewage spillers around the bay and have a decades long targeted campaign to require upgrades. Through our legal action, we've already successfully gotten 10 cities to reduce sewage spills by 75%. But we know that that's not gonna be enough now that we've seen these new age, what, what are supposed to be once every 200 year storm events that we're seeing more frequently now. So we're also advocating to require upgrades to wastewater treatment plants. If that sounds familiar, it's because it's the same solution that would help prevent the harmful red tides that I was talking about a few minutes ago. As I like to say, it's kind of like feeding two birds with one seed. When we get treatment upgrades, we're gonna see a reduction in red tides and in sewage spills around the Bay. Baykeeper is also encouraging the transition to green infrastructure. These are areas with permeable materials and plants that allow for rainwater to percolate into the ground and recharge groundwater instead of flooding streets and overwhelming sewage treatment plants. We're advocating for city planners to make change and to also take legal action to force cities to stop polluting local creeks. And that's extreme weather. It's safe to say that the climate crisis has begun. The Bay really needs us to act now and quickly to make sure it's resilient for what's to come. The next big problem in the Bay that we saw this year involved fossil fuel pollution. We have five oil refineries and multiple coal and pet coke transport facilities around the Bay. So we at Baykeeper are never surprised when our pollution hotline gets a report about oil in the water. Last year, a caller reported seeing oil in the water near the Chevron refinery in Richmond. Baykeeper's investigator was the first responder to arrive on the scene. Surprisingly, Chevron's response crew was nowhere to be seen. It turned out they had no automatic leak detection system. Just let that sink in for a minute. This multi-billion dollar company found out about their own oil spill because a local resident saw oil in the water and pointed it out to us. The pipe had no auto shutoff valve and it ended up spilling about 800 gallons of oil in the bay before the company stopped the leak. The state recently issued Chevron a penalty amounting to $70,000 for the incident. That means the refinery paid less than $90 per gallon for the oil that they spilled. That's not even a slap on the wrist. It's a fist bump between the government agencies and the oil execs. That's why Baykeeper watchdogs refineries, and we hold them accountable when we catch them, as long as the state agencies don't get in our way. And that's what's recently happening with a site in Benicia. We received a pollution hotline report, this time from a whistleblower, telling us that a facility on the shoreline was polluting the bay with some black, nasty product. 
We checked it out by boat, but we couldn't see anything because of the angle of the water. We investigated by car, but we couldn't see anything past the fencing. So then we used the drone and saw everything. We caught the facility polluting the bay with toxic petroleum coke. Pet coke is the dirty dregs of the oil refining process. It's the leftover waste that's illegal to burn in the United States, but it can be shipped overseas for a profit to be burned by other countries. The facility was allowing this toxic material to get in the bay and the neighborhoods of Venetia. And Baykeeper caught them with black plumes in the water and dust clouds in the air six different times. So we sued Valero, the fifth largest corporation in the world. So now it's Baykeeper versus Valero in court. And they know that we caught them red-handed. So we're discussing ways to clean up their operations. And you better believe we're going to ask them to pay a hefty penalty for polluting the Bay and our communities. And finally, let's talk about the problem of sea level rise in the Bay. Back in 2015, Baykeeper partnered with Google to identify more than 1,137 toxic sites that were in the Bay's flood zone. These included former industrial sites, military lands, and current industrial facilities. While sea level rise is projected to be about three feet over the next 50 years in San Francisco Bay, partners at UC Berkeley are determining that groundwater is gonna rise much faster. In fact, in certain areas around the bay, it's already rising. And sometimes it's rising up to three miles inland, which undermines all assumptions that sea level rise is just a shoreline threat. The Baykeeper team is taking a couple of key advocacy actions to help address this threat. We're advocating for general plan updates. That is a really wonky way of saying we're getting the cities to better plan for restoration rather than development of the shoreline. We're pushing for agency reform to require more comprehensive cleanup of toxic sites that take into account sea level rise and groundwater rise. You would not believe the number of cleanup plans that we have reviewed recently, which completely ignore sea level rise and groundwater rise at shoreline sites. And we're also researching how we can use litigation to hold polluters responsible for creating those toxic lands in the first place. Allied is one recent example. Some of our volunteers were kayaking in the Alameda estuary and noticed a site that was covered in these hazardous metal shards. And they reported it to our pollution hotline. When we researched the facility and investigated, we found that an aviation manufacturing company had just been dumping their metal trash over the fence in their back lot. The dump site is now entirely cover covered in these metal shards, buried deep into the soil and right on the bay's shoreline. Our investigators took samples and determined that they were heavy metals like copper and lead leaching into the bay. So we sued the company and the current landowner. And good news, we recently won. We resolved the case two weeks ago and they have to clean up their site over the coming year. Now we're investigating another shoreline toxic site in Pittsburgh, where they have plans to build a housing development called Baywalk. Our field investigators were out there with the drone during this year, during the King Tides, which are some of the highest tides in the year. And they wanted to assess the shoreline. They caught the site underwater. It's the site of a former PG&E power plant that incidentally Baykeeper helped shut down about 10 years ago for pollution. The problem is that this site is underwater already. This is the area where they're planning to build housing and it's toxic. The agency has only authorized it to be cleaned up to industrial use standards, not for residential use. So Baykeeper's advocacy team is now kicking into gear to push the city to more smartly develop the site with sea level and groundwater rise in mind. So that's what's been happening around the Bay this past year on three major issues, extreme weather, fossil fuels, and sea level rise. And I hope you've also gotten a little peek into what Baykeeper is doing to address those issues. Baykeeper has 34 years of experience championing the Bay. We have to be the eyes and ears on the Bay because you have a right to know what's happening. 
we keep an eye out for you through our patrols, and then we use science and law to hold polluters and government agencies accountable. Baykeeper has the only pollution patrol boat on the water. We have 10 volunteer skippers, and we recently expanded to remote drone operations to look over those fences and walls. Those polluters can't keep us out anymore. And Baykeeper science team investigates and gathers evidence. We have logged over 16,000 hours investigating polluters and gathering foolproof evidence of violations. And we use sound science to strengthen our advocacy and our litigation. And then the Baykeeper team has in-house attorneys and we work with pro bono law firms across the Bay. We've successfully resolved more than 300 le legal cases to protect the Bay from pollution. Lots of big victories over our 34 years include stopping sewage spills, reducing trash pollution in San Jose, cleaning up coal export facilities in Richmond and Stockton, stopping the development of the Cargill salt ponds. And in, in addition to winning these cases, we've also directed over $12 million in grants to other nonprofits to protect the Bay through our litigation. because you and your kids deserve a healthy bay. So oftentimes people hear the news and they learn about the climate crisis and all the pollution facing the bay and they feel really helpless. Like they don't really know what to do or how to help or they don't have the time or the experience. And that's where a baykeeper can help you feel better. Our supporters wake up in the morning feeling good about their impact. They're investing in our work and making a difference. So if you're inspired to feel better about the state of the Bay, you can get involved in two key ways. Become a monthly donor and help us support investigating cor corporate polluters and take action to tell government agencies to adopt stronger laws and hold polluters accountable. Our team is putting these links in the chat if you wanna take action and these are live QR codes if you wanna use them. And something that not everyone knows about us, Baykeeper is independent. We don't accept money from polluting corporations. So we can be sure we don't have any conflicts when we decide we need to sue them for polluting the Bay. And look at that, I finished on time. All right, we are ready to take your questions and I am going to stop my screen share. Thanks, Angel. Um, nice. you know, like the old saying goes, it's complicated, right? I mean, it's a, it's a large estuary. We have many, many people. We do many things around it. As you say, we are in smack middle of an urban environment. And as someone who's not a professional, not a scientist, in, but, a, but a skipper and somebody who loves the bay and swimming and sailing on it, I think I, I want to just echo what you say is that the sense of of what can we do about it? Um, I think that's really critical. Um, we are now, many of us are aware of the threats that are facing Bay and the environment, many environments we live in. Um, and I think one of the things that's most uh, positive or rather effective or impactful or all of those things about Baykeeper is that we've actually come up with a strategy and strategies. Can you just for a second, and I, I wanna ask everybody, by the way, if you're with us, please, Put your uh, questions and follow-up questions in the chat. We'd like to talk about them. Uh, we would like to hear what you guys would like to cover. But I want to start with one, say, Joel, is that how would you compare our work today, say, versus 10 years ago or 20 years ago? Like how we look at this, what our strategy is, and how we go about it. Oh, that's another. That's a whole nother presentation, Peter. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, we have definitely gotten more strategic over the years because we know that we have limited resources and we want to use them wisely. So in the last 10 years, we have identified, our science team has identified the biggest threats to the Bay. And literally, I had them sit in a room and come up with an exhaustive list of everything that could harm the Bay and our local communities. And I said, uh, give me the whole list and then let's as a program team walk through everything and understand where we can have the most impact and the most leverage. And so 
we went through that list and actually whittled it down to about nine or 10 different issues that we now focus on in a very targeted and strategic way. Um, and that was a really great exercise because sometimes there are so many things that come in on our pollution hotline or by emails or by meetings that we go to that, that are interesting and we really want to be able to work on everything, but we have to be really focused in order to, to make sure that we're making an impact and spending our resources in a really effective way. So um, I would second that. I think the systemic view of the threats of the Bay and, and, and matching our resources to them, we can't handle everything all at the same time is a key to our effect effectiveness. Um, there's a question here, what will happen when the Bay is three feet higher and rising? What's the biggest threat? Um, we've talked a lot about toxic sites that are not under the water now, but will be. What are our thoughts on that and strategy? Yeah, from our perspective, one of the biggest issues to be worried about is the infrastructure and the toxic shorelines that are right on the water's edge. So three feet, you know, is is a decent amount. And in many places, especially if you look at the shoreline in the North Bay around Belvedere and Tiburon and those communities up there, um, but also around Richmond and Oakland, when you look at the shoreline, you see housing that's right in the flood zone. You see lands that are industrial sites right in the flood zone. And when these get inundated, you're going to have those toxic chemicals leaching out into the community, into the bay, into the nearby parks and creeks and, and other things that are right on the shoreline. And that's going to end up meaning that there's a lot of more toxic pollution in the bay that we have to deal with. And it's not a situation that we want to see because that toxic pollution has been buried in the land for so many years. Uh, many times the local agencies and the Department of Toxic Substance and Control has capped it over and said, OK, we're done here. But the cap of concrete on top of these toxic lands is not gonna keep the water from coming into contact with the pollutants that are under that concrete cap, especially if the water is coming from underneath with the case of groundwater rise. So when you've got all of these toxic chemicals getting into the environment, it's just not gonna be a healthy situation for the Bay. Okay. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting, it's, um... It's trying to glue together using, for example, Clean Water Act laws for something that's not underwater currently. So, right, isn't some of Baykeeper's work really trying to test new legal theories and ways of actually addressing these problems? Yeah, we're in the middle of working with some of our attorneys and outside counsel, looking at different laws that can help us address the toxic contamination and how to get that cleaned up. Because it's not always the Clean Water Act, especially if the pollution is not in contact with the water yet. We are, we are looking at imminent threats or pending threats. And so we have to use different laws to try to address those. So we are, we are exploring those different issues. Um, there was a question here about what are we doing specifically for wildlife um, around the Bay? and how we look at, say, bay health versus wildlife health. Is this a, a distinction, not distinction? However you want to address that, Sejal. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it's, it's a little bit um, of the same side of the coin, just because when we deal with any issue that involves pollution and the bay, we are automatically having a beneficial impact for all of the communities that are nearby and all of the wildlife that could come into contact with that pollution that we've helped reduce. So any issue that we work on, we look at what the benefits are going to be if we were to win that outcome that we're, we're looking for. So we, we try to make sure that it's got some really good community benefits and some really good wildlife benefits. Um, also, we are very hard at work on flows issues. Flows issues are where we've got water coming in from the upper watershed and the delta, and that water needs to be coming into the bay. It needs to be coming in through the delta in order to protect our fish. So that in, in that sense, um, with the flows issues, we are very pointedly working on wildlife health. Um, and that's partly because you can't really have a healthy bay ecosystem unless the wildlife is healthy and thriving. So 
without making sure that we've got enough fresh water coming into the Delta, um, we, we really need to be sure that, that we've got a healthy ecosystem for our wildlife to survive in. Okay, I think we might have lost Peter. Um, um, not too fast, uh, back. <laughs> oh, you're back, okay. Yeah, but, um, quick, good question here, Sejula, about how, do, how does Baykeeper work with other environmental groups? This is a question from Rich. Uh, how do we interface with them? How do we work with them? Yeah, we work really closely with a lot of environmental groups um, and other groups, commercial fisheries, science labs at universities around the Bay. Um, and all of these partners are really critical for our work because we're one small group and we have our niche of litigation and advocacy and science-based litigation and advocacy. Um, but there are all, all of these other groups that are doing shoreline restoration, that are doing cleanups, that are um, getting out there and thinking about um, other issues that we're not working on. And so by partnering, we can actually strengthen the work that we do and help support the work that other groups do. So we work really closely in a lot of coalitions on a lot of these issues, especially when we're fighting big problems like oil refineries and coal facilities. So when we fought the coal facilities in Richmond and in Oakland and in Vallejo, we had community partners. We were partnering with the Sierra Club. We were partnering with Earth Justice. Um, and we had a lot of strong partners in the community as well. And that's really critical to our work because we know we're a small team with limited resources. And we also we know we have legal expertise to share and scientific expertise to share. So we try to work together as much as possible. There's a question here from Ben Chun about um, companies that are doing business on and around Bay that are we, we consider model citizens and that are working to improve their practices and help the environment as opposed to degrade it or pollute it. Um, thoughts on that? Yeah, so when we file a lawsuit against a, a polluter, they have typically already self-reported their violations. So when a, a, when a, a company is operating on the shoreline, they have um, to get a lot of different permits. A lot of them complain about being overregulated. We would say that's not the case, um, but they have to submit reports that say, this is how much uh, stormwater has come off of our site and what the pollutants are in it. These are the ways that we are storing hazardous chemicals on our site and disposing of them properly. And many times those self reports get put into a proverbial filing cabinet and never looked at again by the agencies. So Baykeeper's role is really to pull those files out, take a look at all these facilities and make sure that the companies are actually not harming the bay when they're work when they are operating here because it's fine to be operating on the shoreline it's fine to be operating in the bay area we just want you to be doing it in as clean and sustainable a way as possible and those that word sustainable is not a buzzword for us it actually means something it's best management practices it's what can you do on your site to make sure that you're not having an impact on the bay or the communities that you're operating in yeah, I think that's a really critical point. I mean, we have a lot of these issues are legacy issues, right, of practices and even activities that happened, let's face it, from the Second World War with the shipbuilding, with the Navy, with a lot of tech, um, a lot of industrialization that happened very quickly without a lot of regulation. And so some of it's catch up, but some of it's definitely pushing people to be more, just get their game on in terms of, in terms of operating in a way that doesn't degrade the bay and it can be done. Uh, here's a one that's close to home. Uh, Lindy Novak asks, is our is our patrol boat out every day? Um, and do we offer uh, do we offer tours of the bay for interested supporters? Yes, um, yes, we can definitely take anyone out who's interested. Uh, we don't go out every day. Um, we go out about once a week, and we are looking for polluters, and we are educating people, but we're also out there as a deterrent because many of these companies that operate on the shoreline realize now that we're out there watching them. And it, it does help. They, they wave to our team when, they're, when we're on the boat and we're coming by. 
Um, and they, they know that they should not be doing bad things. Um, so they, they know we're watching. So it's helpful. And in the early days, in the early days, I remember a couple of one, one finger waves more than a few. <laughs> so uh, here's another one. Um, would we consider suing the water board if water uh, quality flow regs are illegally relaxed again? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we have a number of lawsuits right now against both the water board, the state, uh, other state agencies um, for flow regulations, for flow standards, and making sure that those flow standards are improved. So uh, we're going to be strategic about what lawsuits we bring, but certainly that's not out of the question. Right. In the follow-up, uh, Jeff Critchfield was asking something similar about how our positions on um, basically our strategies with the impact of, you know, agriculture, Southern California use of water and how the balancing of that very long-standing debate. Yeah, I mean, we are definitely opposed to the Delta Tunnel project. We have already voiced our concerns on that issue. Um, and anything that's going to siphon water off from the Delta and keep our wildlife and our fish from thriving is problematic. So when you're talking about ag diversions and you're talking about uh, Southern California diversions from the, the San Francisco Bay Delta watershed, uh, it's something that we're really going to fight against. We're going to make sure that those interests are getting the the largest obstacles possible to not be able to make those diversions because we we know scientifically it's it, we're shown scientifically that the fish are not in good condition in the the bay delta and we really do need to improve freshwater flows at very specific times of the year in order to make sure that those populations are healthy and thriving and you know with i, I believe the bay has six endangered species already and uh, they're at the point of extinction and that's just a really sad place for us to be in when we have plenty of water it's just not properly allocated yeah i just wanted to throw mention to uh attendees that we have we were very lucky that one of the top fisheries and flows per um, experts in the country and in, in california john rosenfield joined us now almost five years ago as a senior scientist and uh, yeah, i think we should have john do one of these state of the base right he would be excellent at that, yeah right? he, he do. Um, Great job. We, it's, a, it's a lot of knowing uh to use the term where the bodies are buried right i mean knowing how these regulations have mm -hmm. evolved where the weaknesses are where we can be strategic um yeah. i think that's a lot of, it, it speaks to a lot of the effectiveness of what big keeper does yeah. uh, we're not just concerned about flows we actually have specific strategies that we can Boy. Um, I see this question from Pamela that I wanted to answer because uh, it's a good one on, uh, on increased flows and algal blooms. So that's a really good question, Pamela. Um, in the Delta, yes, that is the case. When you have increased flows in the Delta, those algal blooms are caused by uh, too much uh, agricultural pollution in the water, too much uh, stagnant water. And that's what's happening up in the Delta where you've got that toxic green algae. In the Bay, it's a little bit of a different story. The freshwater flows are not actually gonna help with the situation here because um, we just have too much nitrogen and phosphorus pollution coming from those wastewater treatment plants. So it's really about reducing that food that the algae can use here. Sejo, question from Mark McGuire about who are the specific agencies elected bodies that we most would like to engage with, not just uh, as Baykeeper staff, but like Baykeeper supporters making the, our concerns heard? Yeah, I would say for our work, the agencies that matter the most are the Regional Water Quality Control Board, um, the Bay Conservation and Development Commission, BCDC, um, and lately the Department of Texas Substance Control. So uh, other than local city agencies, which we obviously work with all the time, um, we are pushing DTSC, the Regional Water Board, and BCDC to do a, a even better job of protecting the Bay. Um, we want to be sure that they're doing what their mandates require. And oftentimes we do get the sense that they are meeting with the polluters, the dischargers, the landowners, 
so frequently that the, that those entities kind of have these agencies ears and there's a I won't say they're in cahoots but at least not not on this podcast uh not on this webinar um I will I will say that there is a very cozy relationship with with those entities and the agencies and we often see very lax regulations because of that. We see loopholes being built in, safe harbor provisions being built in to very straightforward permits that should just be requiring pollution reduction and should be enforceable by community groups like ours. We should be able to, to take a law and say, you're not following it and here's how and, and file that lawsuit. And oftentimes we can't do that because the agency has built in so many different loopholes and safe harbors that it makes it really hard. Yeah, I think to maybe follow up on that and, and touch on, go to where maybe Mike was going with this, is I think this is where the volunteers and the followers, and the members of Baykeeper are important. Uh, it is well demonstrated in American conservation history, and environmental history, that active engaged populace is a big part of um, making this work. Like people know Baykeeper, they know the staff, but when they hear from other corners that this is a concern, people are worried about this, they want to see change, mm -hmm. that has a big impact, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, one of the things we've been doing lately is really working to increase Baykeepers membership, because when we go to agencies, when we submit letters to them, we want to be able to say, we represent the 7 million people that live around San Francisco Bay. That's going to get an agency to stand up and listen and say, oh, wait, what I'm doing is being watched by a lot of people. Um, if we can get to that number, that would be awesome. Uh, but we'll, we'll strive to get closer to that every day. Yeah. Um, I see a great question from Jason. Hey, Jason. Um, any shoreline site the cities that are good models for sea level rise adaptation? Um, I Yes, I think Alameda, the city of Alameda has been doing some really great things over there. We worked closely with them on um, a paved area that uh, they actually recently got approved and funding to depave. So it's, it's called depave park, affectionately called that, um, because they're gonna be restoring it to wetlands and basically creating a really nice marsh area that is a buffer to sea level rise protection. And, you know, Alameda has to be at the forefront of that, given that they are an island out there in the bay. So um, they've, they've got the right ideas. There's a question here about um, moratoriums um and about development how are we in the state and and the entities around many of them cities dealing with the issue of development especially with sea level rise and the rest of it is there a cohesive vision or is there one developing around um, how we control and or mitigate development around the bay yeah that's a really great complicated question uh unfortunately there's not really an easy answer. Um, and that's partly because there is not a comprehensive development plan for the Bay's shoreline. Uh, it's all kind of done piecemeal. Um, each city has their own zoning rules and their own general plans and development proposals. Um, and I think with the legislative push to really build more housing around the Bay, we are seeing cities identify these parcels on the shoreline that could be restored really well by cleaning up the toxic pollutants, uh, restoring the marsh areas, and then building housing a little bit more inland. Um, but sometimes those housing plans are not as thoughtful as we would want them to be. And that's the, the case that we're seeing with Pittsburgh, for example. Their preliminary plans are really to build that housing development right on that uh, old power plant site. And that's just a toxic mess. It's, it's a recipe for another Bayview Hunters Point situation where they think the site is all cleaned up and then all of a sudden uh, people are living in housing, new brand new housing there and they're being pushed out of their housing because it's a toxic mess. And, and that's really not the thing that we wanna see all around the Bay. So. We are working really hard to identify those areas where 
the development, especially housing development, needs to be better thought out and, and really needs to be addressed in a more creative and, and proactively clean way. Um, so we're really we're really identifying those and working hard on that. But it is complicated because there's not one single uniform way of handling those sites, unfortunately. Yeah, this touches on Margaret's comment about the Zeneca site in Richmond, um, which is a similar, you know, for those who don't know, it's a super fun site. Um, it had, I believe, pharmaceutical manufacturing or other there, items, uh, sorry, activities there. So yeah, so unfortunately that site is not listed as a super fun site. I, I wonder if it would actually get cleaned up better if there were an EPA were in charge of cleaning it up, it, it probably would be handled better. Right now, what we're seeing at Zeneca is the agencies in charge kind of pointing fingers at each other. So DTSC is saying, oh, that's the regional water board's responsibility when it comes to the shoreline marsh area. And the regional water board says, no, no, DTSC is taking care of the land cleanup. So obviously they're going to take care of the shoreline marsh cleanup as well. Uh, and that that site is a one big toxic mess. It's a great example of where the, the agencies really need to get on board with a thoughtful, strategic way of developing a site, especially one that's so toxic. And when you've got a toxic site, you know, we want ex excavation of that toxic material. We want to see a total cleanup of that site to proper residential health standards. Uh, but then where are we sending those hazardous materials? It's such a hard, complicated question uh, that we really need to be thinking really carefully about. Um. As we, as we wrap up towards the end of the half hour, Shanti asked a question about uh, how about doing a news broadcast um, about the Bay uh, good idea or a Bay model visit site. I think oh, really, yes. um, really good idea. Um, yeah. I think generally though, it is in line with this whole state of the Bay effort, which is to continue to, to communicate with all of you about uh, those of all of us who live around the Bay and care for the Bay about what the issues are, so you guys feel informed. Um, we hear, we have many of our most important cases actually started with somebody calling in and reporting uh, uh, something odd in the water, a pollution, a sheen, any of those things. So um, we are keen as an organization, I think it's fair to say, to be, to, to continue our outreach, to continue our communication, to meet with more people. Um, and if it's on boat patrols or bay model visits, that sort of thing, uh, yes, please stay tuned. I think I can speak for Sajel, but I don't want to totally. Uh, that that's really a priority. Uh, thoughts on that? Definitely a priority. We we definitely want to bring more educational material to you guys. Uh, thank you, Elliot. We do have a pollution hotline. If you do see pollution in the bay, give us a call. Uh, it's one eight hundred Keep Bay. Very easy to remember. Um, and yes, I'm really hoping that a more informed membership means that we are out there with more eyes and ears on the bay. Um, happy to take folks out on the boat. Let us know if you're interested. Um, but even more excited to see our monthly memberships grow. Um, that is really what's going to move the needle for us when we can have the support that we can count on to be the eyes and ears on the bay every single day without having to worry, um, getting that drone out there, getting those investigators out there, following up on pollution hotline tips. It all takes a little bit of support and every, every little bit counts. So becoming a monthly donor is really helpful. And then we can go to those agencies and say, we represent 7 million people around the bay and we want you to do this. We want you to stop polluting the bay by having these weak, weak permits. So that is, that's the goal. That's the vision. That's the goal. So please sign up um, to the newsletter and become a member, uh, donate monthly, you know, these kinds of things, uh, small amounts, but they are impactful. Um, I can't overestimate how many times the thing has really kept Baykeeper going beyond the amazing staff and focus staff is just the support of all these um, volunteers and people who care. I mean, I, I can, I've seen you guys and the staff, you guys work really hard and the work is not always rewarding. Um, these are difficult, thorny issues. Um, a lot of them are, are quite frankly, tough um, to consider and tough to try to find a solution. But, um, you know, I think all of us kind of 
standing shoulder to shoulder and wanting to make a clean bay is going to be how it's going to happen. Um, yes. So please become a member and please bring other people into the fold. Yes. Perfect way to end. Thank you guys all so much for joining us. It was so fun to do this. We are definitely doing more of it. Um, and I see lots of familiar faces and names in the chat. So nice to see you guys. Thanks for joining us. And we will see you soon. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.